is goods everyone loves skin size things peach giant chocolate jumbo sandwiches or big thali as you might have already heard size matters as long as it hits the right spot this is just not the story of the cadbury dairy milk although it is this is a story of the things that we experience every day every minute of our life but no one bothers to go deep in it if you're born in 90s or 2000 you might have noticed that back in just 10 15 years cadbury dairy milk used to be a lot bigger and used to come with paper and foil wrap but now everything is gone although the price hasn't been changed yet but today's dairy milk is no way near to what it was back when i was just a little kid and you can see this trend in almost every commodity item where either the things get expensive on regular intervals or the quantity gets reduced to maintain the same price but you might not know how ancient chinese the world war and richard nixon have played important role to keep decreasing the size of cadbury and no this isn't any conspiracy theory this is a story that you have probably never heard before let's get to the point and let's try to answer this question first we need to talk about money that's exactly the foundation of the world that we see around us the minute that you step out of your home to go on a date the minute that you decide to get a contraceptive to have safe sex the minute that you born the minute that you die money involves everywhere money is the reason why you see all of this building exist in the first place but what is money let's find it out to begin this story we have to go back way back into our ancient caveman days the life was pretty simple all you need to do was hunt an animal provide food for family a source of water and reliable shelter this continued for fair longer time until we hit upon agriculture age where everyone started to specialize in specific area which gave rise to various career opportunities like farming pottery blacksmith etc what it really means was that prior to agriculture revolution our needs was confined to fewer things resulting in easier management of economics but when you specialize yourself to only few things we need a mechanism to trade our services or goods with other person to satisfy our own needs and desire presenting you the barter system which you might have already heard in your school days the idea is to exchange good i have wheat you have rice so let's exchange both of our good in roughly the equal quantities but what happens if you want to exchange rice for corn then you might want to find someone who is willing to trade with you or first exchange the good to me and then in turn i'll get it to you but how the price of wheat was compared to other commodities like corn rice milk etc you might argue that it takes lot effort to grow pomegranate than wheat so in exchange of pomegranates you will demand more wheat but that doesn't necessarily make sense because efforts are subjective for one person to other take for example this painting which requires months and months to create in its final stages you might think that this painting should be priced exorbitantly but as long as no one is interested in buying it it's essentially worthless so the price of any product is based on demand and supply that we popularly know today but again who will decide what's the demand and supply well the market does In free flowing market any buyer generally wants to buy the things at lowest price and seller wants to sell at maximum margin even today we see this behavior when we want to go to shop things online or when we want to go to buy some grocery items in retail store coming back to the barter system as we have discussed there's a lot problem that comes while exchanging the goods to resolve it we need an intermediary mechanism through which any goods can be easily exchanged in return of a token which could also facilitate the spirit of free market enter the concept of money imagine a token in which you can exchange anything imagine that you have one token as a form of money you go to the fruit seller to get a fruit in exchange of that token and further that fruit seller can use the same token to get any goods that he want but at this point of time we are again at dilemma that what is money as far as what i have understood money is a way to trade human efforts and ingenuity across space and time it takes effort to produce good crop it takes effort to make pottery it takes effort to repair electricals in our home and many more since our efforts and desire are far more than we can met ourselves we need to trade and transact our effort with other people in society and money is that lubricant which easily allows to do that So we have talked about the token which you can use as money but what are the characteristics of that token from which you can make money out of technically you can make money out of anything stone pebbles precious rocks etc 
In ancient Rome, salt was used to pay the soldiers. Cigarettes are used as money in jails. For kids, it can be anything like playing cards. But obviously, at mass scale for everyone, we can't make money out of anything. So money has to contain some key characteristics. Number one, since money is about training human efforts and ingenuity, we need a money which is resistant to counterfeit, as we don't want our efforts to be stolen. An example of this is around 16th century, agribeads, which is made up of glass, being used as a form of currency in Africa. As for Africans, making glass was extremely difficult, making it valuable for them. But it was not for Europeans, as they have already mastered the art of glass making, which allowed them to mass produce the fake agribeads, which were really identical to original ones at very low cost. And soon, the wealth of Africans started to plunder. This is something any today's age central authorities are very well aware of. So, they make it extremely difficult to counterfeit any physical hard cash. There's an ink which glows under UV light, there's a 3D textures and whatnot. And if you're planning to set up a printing press that could print fake currencies, then I have a bad news for you. There are only few organizations that could provide you the raw material and machinery required to print money. Also, the intelligence service has a key eye on whoever buy those machines. So, if you are trying to buy those one, you will be on their radar. Jake Trent has brilliantly demonstrated about it in his video which I'll link down in the description or in the i cards above. Second property, money should be in fixed supply. Counterfeiting and supply of money goes hand in hand. If your money is resistant to counterfeit, the value of the product and service will remain intact as long as you don't print too much money in the market. The prime example is Zimbabwe and Venezuela. Third characteristics, money should be easily divisible. This one is fairly easy to understand. You need a money which could let you buy daily essential as well as the expensive jewelry. So you need to have money in various denominations like 1, 2, 5, 10, 20, 50, 100, 500, 2000 node, etc. As long as you obey these two rules, you can create your own money. Again, let's come back to the historic time. First, we need to answer this question that who will create the money? Like as I mentioned, people started to specialize in agriculture era, which gave rise to kings and army. Naturally, king having the highest authority, people trusted king to mint coin out of metals like bronze, silver and our beloved gold. But why gold? Gold is available in really limited quantity and it's extremely difficult to mine it out. Until today, alchemists have failed to figure out how to create gold out of other elements like lead, mercury, etc. which makes it an ideal choice to being used as money. Ancient Chinese used this coin which had hole in it and similar was the case with ancient India where we had used various coins made up of bronze, silver and gold. This is the type of money called as a commodity money. What it really means is the value of this money inherently lies in those metals which in theory if you are living in ancient India and had to travel to China what you can do is just melt the gold coin and shape it to what they might like to accept. But again, there is a problem to metal currencies that it's extremely difficult to carry if it's in large quantities, like transporting thousands of coins. And as you might have guessed it, humans are smart when it comes to dealing with challenging problems. So they invented paper money, that is I owe you, which literally means I owe you. What it really means is that suppose you take all of your gold coin and kept it at goldsmith or the king which everyone trusts, then at a modest fee, they issue you a paper note aka IOU with a stamp from the king or the goldsmith certifying that it's legit paper money and you can redeem your gold in exchange of this paper note whenever you want. Ladies and gentlemen, this innovation of gold custodian was the first bank in the history of human civilization. Again, ancient Chinese were the first to invent paper money. Soon, even other parts of the world followed the same footsteps. And this was the beginning of the gold standard of money which lasted until 1971. Most of these gold custodians aka bank were under control of kings and rulers. Be it Medici in Italy, the French had its own treasury. This marked the beginning of money and power being working together hand in hand. Whoever controls the supply of money had the ultimate power and that was the birth of the centralized economy that we know today. As for people, it made the life easy since they don't need to carry the heaps of coin and all of their money was represented in paper money. But soon, these gold custodians saw a weird phenomena that people were no longer redeeming the gold. They were just exchanging this receipt with people on a daily basis, hoping that gold was stored safely in the banks. Now imagine for a while, you are the one that controls the bank. Would you have a desire to print more and more money and buy some of them for yourself? If no one is coming at you to check whether you're doing a job correctly or not, there's a quote, 
power corrupts corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely and you bet they just did that instead of keeping all the gold idle in the bank they started to lend money out for loan to buy home farmlands etc that my friend was the beginning of fractional reserve banking just remember this for now and we'll talk about it later the best part about the gold standard was that it kept the government in check from overspending and keep their economic health in remain intact. But you know, we humans are the slave of our own human nature which comprises of greed, fear, desire, hunger for more power, etc. Naturally, kings from long time always had the ambition of territorial acquisition and power which led them to go on war. You might know that war is an expensive endeavor and honestly, most kings didn't have sufficient funds in their treasury to pay for all of the logistics of the war. So, what they did was something today's government do on a regular basis, that is to issue bonds. Bonds are the loan that government borrows from public on a promise that they will return somewhere down the line in future. And if there's any place on the earth that has witnessed massive amount of bloodshed, you bet that's Europe. The Italian, the French Revolution, World War I, World War II, stories of Romans, Spartans, I mean, it's just utter madness and chaos. If you had watched the movie like Troy, Gladiators, Spartacus, you might have understood what I'm trying to say here. But in every war, there's a winner and loser. If you happen to lose the war, you can't repay the bond. Since the society was based on fractional reserve banking, the economy was supposed to collapse, which really happened many times in history. The popular example itself is less than 20 years old. The collapse of the Lehman Brothers, which caused the 2008 crisis. And in India, it's the bailout of the Yes Bank and Punjab National Bank, which happened in the last two years. But you might question, what is fractional reserve banking? To answer it, first, we need to discuss what is full reserve banking. Let's assume that there is a bank which tells you to deposit 100 rupees and out of that 100 rupees you can use 70 rupees in whatever way that you want. Rest 30 rupees will be locked for a period of time and bank will lend out that money as a loan to others. So if the person really repays that loan, bank will really share the interest with you. In this method, no new money is being created but in fractional reserve banking it's opposite of it. Let's say the RBI gives 1000 rupees to the bank. Now banks are made compulsory to keep 10% of that amount as a reserve. So the bank keep 100 rupees as a reserve and lends 900 rupees as loan to other person. But you will be shown as if you have 1000 rupees in your bank account which you can withdraw anytime. Now if that person takes that amount, probably he would store that in his bank account itself. So according to the prior case, the person will have 90 rupees as a reserve and bank will lend further 810 rupees as loan to other person. This will continue till the amount essentially becomes zero. Basically, it can be summed up as an infinite series where the amount circulated in economy can be denoted by this formula. To simplify for every thousand rupees the RBI sent to the bank, the bank generates 10,000 rupees in economy which is scary and definitely creates the inflation. Finally, we are getting closer to our puzzle. It was around 20th century where almost every European nation economy has collapsed due to World War I and World War II. And they had already borrowed money from US as a loan in exchange of gold as collateral. During the World War, many European countries witnessed hyperinflation, example being Nazi regime in Germany, Hungary, Yugoslavia, etc. They decided to peg the currency for dollar. Since dollar was on the gold standard, you can redeem it with gold bar anytime. But you know, things in real life aren't as cozy like fairy tales. Since US emerged as superpower in the 20th century, it started to project its dominance over the globe by various means. Sometimes I feel like US is that bad boy who is obsessed with patrolling across the globe and also a spoiled child who loves to buy the things on credit. This is a representation of how much debt US has and its massive $20 trillion in just 2017. Now, I want to clarify that I'm not making fun of general American public. I'm just pointing out the flaws of US government monetary policies. Even we Indians are not perfect, so that kind of equalizes things together. Starting from 20th century itself, US citizens started to spend heavily to buy the car, house, farmlands, etc. They got the loan to buy the various stocks since the stock was really booming before the Great Recession. But as soon as the Great Recession hit, the US economy plummeted. It took almost 20 years to recover from it. Many times in 20th century itself, US went off and on of the gold standard to print more money in order to revive the economy. Incidents like Vietnam War and the way the US government spent the money made other countries skeptical that US is spending more money than the gold reserve it holds. So they started to withdraw the gold back into their own nation which caused the fluctuation in value of dollar. 
Finally, to stop the fluctuation in value of dollar, former US President Richard Nixon took a bold step in 1971 of what was supposed to be a temporary experiment which is even going right now, known as Nixon shock. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. In full cooperation with the International Monetary Fund and those who trade with us, we will press for the necessary reforms to set up an urgently needed new international monetary system. What it really meant was that US dollar was no longer pegged to the gold, making it a fiat currency, which means by degree. Just because I say so this is 100 rupees note, it is 100 rupees note and I don't need to derive it out of gold standard which is scary. But why should you care about it? Almost every currency in the world is linked to the US dollar and even we Indians compare our rupees with dollar. This incident gave power to US government to print as much as money as they want. This is the reason why you see government taking reckless decision and spending money on wars. Wars are the result of inflation. If there is no inflationary economy, then going on to the war would be very challenging as what US is really doing in Afghanistan, Iraq, etc. Well, if you screw up any decision, all you need to do is just make your printing machine go purr. And in today's digital age, this has become more even sophisticated since money is represented as a set of numbers in Federal Bank SQL database. So all you need to do is just update the digit in that database and voila, suddenly the life of millions across the globe will be screwed and they will have no home to live in. This is something like playing a Monopoly game where no matter how you play the game, I get to decide what the rules of this game will be. So every time it's just me that's winning the game and Federal Bank is sitting on that monopoly which no one can shake immediately, thus driving the inflation to the moon. There's a website called WTF happened in 1971 where they have mentioned an effects of Nixon shock. Take a look at this chart from 1948 to 1971. You were paid equally based on your productivity but that totally changed after 1971. Since inflation started to kick in, the productivity dramatically increases but the wages were left way behind. Instead, the cost of goods and service should have gone down because our human productivity increased but that really didn't happen. Instead, the price actually went up due to inflation. Same is the case with fertility rate. Before 1971, each woman on an average gave birth to 5 children but now it's just around 2 or 3. US debt has shot up to the moon and prior to 1971, the cost of living was very low. So to fight against inflation, people have three options. First one is to use cheap material to keep the cost and quantity the same. Second one is to increase the price. Third one is to decrease the quantity or service in which three of these things aren't good for your health and pocket. So now you might realize that why Category Daily Mill size has reduced. So because at the end of the time, they are for profit company and they need to report to their investors. So what's the solution of it? First, bring back the gold standard, which I'm sure no government is going to do that because it restricts their ability and it prevents them from overspending, which, which they absolutely hate it. The second step is to mass adoption of Bitcoin. Now, I know this video has already gone too long to discuss about Bitcoin, but I really want to cover it because being a self taught developer, I really want to cover like where are the mining servers? What would be the effect of bureaucracy when if, if everyone really adopts Bitcoin? We probably don't need the government if Bitcoin and it threatens the individual sovereignty. So there are multiple aspects of Bitcoin that I really want to cover. So stay subscribed for the next part 2 video. Till then, stay connected and I'll see you next time.